Hello and welcome to the Behind the Laughs Comedy Podcast, the show where we interview comedians to see their view on comedy and how it all started. My name is Andrew and I'm with my dad Mike, and together we are going to interview Jason Douglas, a comedian of 15 years, a national headliner, and he has even opened for the Beach Boys, Dennis Miller, Ron White, and many more. Mike, what's happening? Is this the famous Jason Douglas? <laughs> Mildly yeah. famous for the wrong reasons. So we'll, we'll be on the phone a little bit, and it's going to be about your favorite subjects. It's all about you. I, I really, I really want to know, like, <laughs> finally, yeah. somebody wants to listen. Yes, to me. I know, I know. So I'm going to ask you about the comedy business, but I want, I wonder if you could pull it back to like the very, very beginning, and tell me about your comedy journey. What in the world made you start being even interested in stand-up comedy? I wanted to be a comedian. Uh, it was 1998, 1997, 98 is when I started to really want to be a comedian. I went on stage for the first time in March of 98. Seinfeld was like the number one show in the country. And here I am from this small town, nothing going on. Jerry Seinfeld's a comedian. He's got this great apartment in New York. He never seems to work. He hangs out all day. He, he tells jokes. He's with beautiful women. Every episode's a different woman he's dating. And I was like, I want to do this. So are you saying that the Seinfeld show, watching that show, started influencing your thinking about doing stand-up comedy? I mean, I love stand-up comedy before, but watching the show, I was like, oh, this is a real career. So tell me about... Not knowing that the show really wasn't... There's not a lot of guys who are able to live that lifestyle in comedy. No, no. And, you know, we're going to talk about some of that as well. But how about before that? What was your first exposure to comedy where... Before you even got on stage, like when I was a little kid... I told my son, Andrew, I used to watch the Dean Martin roast. That was kind of my first exposure to kind of stand-up comedy. Do you remember, like, your first exposure even on TV watching comedy? Yeah. My dad loved stand-up comedy. He loved watching it. And uh, he, I remember seeing uh, Louis Anderson on TV. And when you're a kid, Louis Anderson, because he's clean and funny and does the family stuff, you know, a 10-year-old can still laugh at that. Absolutely. And then when he'd have like the Andrew Dice Clay or the Kennison on, I remember him letting me watch it and him laughing a lot, but me not really getting it <laughs> until later. <laughs> so like, like how often did your dad watch comedy? Well, I mean, this is, we're talking the eighties right. now, so there probably wasn't that much comedy on. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, I probably wasn't overly exposed to comedy, but it did have a, a lasting uh, impression so do you think and uh, I guess I'd say my my first influence I think most comedians first influence to really uh even though it's not stand up is uh, the three stooges oh that's a good point no oh, one have, yeah. no one has said that to us before though so just watching the three stooges like the Marx brothers got you excited to laugh he, I, I, yeah as a kid for sure and and so do you think if your dad would never watch stand up comedy that you'd think differently about it today because that's kind of if you're ten years old watching that that's kind of in your system now kind of embedded in you now yeah yeah when i was a teenager in the 90s because uh, i was born in 79 but but you know by the mid 90s comedy central had so many comedians on that i probably would have got exposed to it somehow okay i just probably got exposed to it much earlier you know i had a positive thing with comedy because my dad watched it and liked it so i liked it uh you know so it was probably mentally like was in me like, oh comedy's really good that's something you know me and my dad like Right, right. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's kind of now in like the Dean Martin roast. I think cemented comedy for me. That you know, if you can make people laugh and cry, it's a fun night for everyone, including the people making jokes. So I, it was just definitely yeah. And those still test, stand the test of time. I've not seen every Dean Martin roast, but when they pop up and I've seen them, even on the uh, infomercials, they make you laugh. Yeah, they are absolutely unbelievable. So, when was the first? time that you thought hey i'm gonna get on stage and give this a try do you remember when that was it would have been like early 1998 i did comedy for the first time in march but i started calling the comedy clubs in my area in like january there was two comedy clubs and this is you know your son doesn't realize what comedy used to be even it, people say how great comedy was in the 80s it's nowhere what it used to be in the 90s as far as comedy clubs we've lost so many 
but I grew up in a town that had two comedy clubs and had a population of maybe 80,000 people. Just tell me about the – And now that town has no comedy <laughs> <Yeah>. clubs. <laughs> but I would – yeah. so I would call these two clubs yeah. all the time, and I'd be like, How, what, do you have an open mic? And they were like, yeah, sometimes we do call but back. how did you know what an open mic I'm even like, was? Yeah. Well, I probably didn't know the term open mic. Okay. I probably said, how do you become a comedian? Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm assuming that's probably what I said. Probably, okay. And I just, they kept telling me to call back. So, like, <laughs> I would be like, what day and time? And I would call back that day and time, and finally they let me do it. So, are you saying you made a phone call to a comedy club and they just let you on stage without ever seeing you or anything? Yeah, two months later, on like a Thursday night. It was a Thursday. And were you required to bring people like the way they do today? No, that's fascinating. No. That's fascinating. I'm fascinated by this. So, so they our business has changed so much for the worse as far as helping new talent. It's uh, it's terrible. I mean, like I never did this whole uh, club thing. I, I mean, I've just been on stage maybe in clubs five times in my whole life. So this is interesting to me. So you're a young guy. You call up and you say, "I want to be on stage," and they say yes on a Thursday night. That's crazy. That's after crazy. like after probably six to eight weeks of calling them. Wow. And then they let me come up every Thursday and, and MC the show. Well, I, I didn't start off MCing the show because I didn't know how to be an MC. And then one week they were like, oh, you can be the MC. And I totally screwed it up and screwed up the comedian's <laughs> name. <laughs> uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Well, tell me about the first time. Well, tell me about well, the first I was a kid. I had never even been in a bar. What about the first time you performed? Did you pre – okay, they say, okay, we get you on on Thursday. Did you, like, start hyperventilating and saying, I don't even know what I'm going to say? Or did you have something you were preparing the whole time? No, I was that guy who was practicing it in front of the mirror, not really realizing that's not – once you get on stage, everything's completely different. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I did the total first time holding my hand over my uh, eyes to see the audience and <laughs> sweating and, uh, you know, terrible. How, how much time did you do? Do you remember? Was it two minutes? Was it like 10 minutes? It, it, no, it was probably five to seven minutes. Oh. It was longer than I probably should have been up there. <laughs> you... but, but the club owner didn't. It, here's the thing. The club owner is also a comedian named Dan Ballard funny comedian and the the comedy club was owned i think it was owned by the the same people that owned the deja vu strip club uh -oh. so this guy was also like the manager of the strip oh, club uh -huh. so he didn't even come in I, I think like he goes okay go on stage and then he like left to go to the strip club and i, I didn't know anything about comedy and i didn't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> did you I mean, he really didn't seem to care about comedy all that much, but he's a hilarious comedian. That's the funny part about it. Well, people who don't care seem to be the best comics, I find. People who just really don't care, not just say they don't care. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of what kind of jokes did you – do you remember any joke that you actually did that night? No. I was actually watching a video the other day of Andrew Dice Clay and Louie Anderson that Andrew Dice Clay posted on Facebook of those guys in the 80s sitting around a house talking about comedy. Yeah. And their first jokes, and I was like, "Man, that it's too bad that I don't really remember any of my jokes." Did you get any? Did you remember before you get on stage how nervous you were that first night? Do you remember that? Oh, I remember my left or right leg. One of my legs was shaking so bad on stage. I was like, "I think I'm gonna pass out." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I was ill prepared for anything in stand-up comedy. It was nothing like television or Seinfeld. You know, but yet. Not only were you ill-prepared, but you called like 10 times for, for this terrible experience. I, I tell comedians, I go, if you just like are consistent and show up on time, you're like automatically before telling a joke in the top 20% of comedians. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Still? Like the bar is so low for comedians. <laughs> All right. So, so I, I got, I gathered you know, you you went back there just because you wanted to do comedy, and you you must have had a couple of laughs, otherwise you wouldn't have went back, right, Jason? I mean, you must have had some. Oh laughs. yeah, yeah. I mean, the rush was the rush was definitely there. Um, and then I called the other comedy club that did Friday and Saturday nights, and that guy was a he was a crazy dude. He had two comedy clubs in Michigan. It was an old Moose Lodge, but it was a Moose Lodge bowling alley. It was like three stories tall. And it was probably 30,000 square. It was, it was bigger than a Kroger. And he had this little comedy club in there, and the whole rest of the building was vacant. <laughs> and he lived, he lived in the front of the building 
in an old beauty salon and he would come out of the door in the front of the salon door. I remember it said, ooh la la salon. Oh my gosh. Oh, Back to the future. Ooh la la. So I, just, I don't even think he was legally allowed to live there. <laughs> so did, did, did... He was like 75 years old. <laughs> Did he let you perform on the weekend? And I, that's how I became a, a, a real comedian. Jack Papor is, if anybody asks me who made me a comedian, Jack Papor out of Saginaw. Because I showed up, called him up. It was two shows Friday, two shows Saturday. And it's hard to get stage time when you're starting out. Yep. You can go to open mics and perform for other comedians sometimes or no audience. Right. And this guy let me MC every Friday and Saturday, 15 minutes each show. Now, an hour a week of premium stage time when you're 19 years old. Uh, that, no, that's that's, a, that's nice. amazing to me because now, your yeah. first time on stage there, did you host? Yes, he he just booked a feature and a headliner, and this is now in like I this was in May of 1998. So I did about six shows at the first comedy club on the Thursday nights, right. which would get some people right. 40 people oh, maybe, okay. and then I went there and some shows he'd have a hundred plus people. And then it made him pretty good at crowd work because he had uh, the same people would come every week yeah, so, sometimes. So a good host is hard to find. I've learned that over the years. So he basically said, hey, I got I got a feature and a headliner, and I'll let this guy give a jab at hosting, right? That's what happened. Oh, yeah, totally. And I tell comedians who are starting out, you know, you get these guys starting out, and they're like, yeah, I want to get paid. And I'm like, I worked that club for two years with no pay, and it was worth more than than a million dollars. Okay, okay, so I want to talk about that. So you never got paid in the two years you hosted that show? No, he only paid a feature and a headliner, and I wasn't going to ask him for money because I brought nothing extra to the show. <laughs> and, and so – I was so happy to be there. I probably would have paid him. No, that's a great point. And you were on every weekend, every Friday and Saturday? Every Friday and Saturday, and then you think about hanging out in a comedy club every Friday and Saturday with a headliner and a feature act that are road comedians and learning from them, watching them. I would watch them like it was a game film from uh, you know, a, a football player. Okay, so it just occurred to me that if, if you didn't have that experience, you might not be doing comedy today. Is that fair or no? Yeah, I think I probably would have got just burned out on going to open right. mics and not right. ever getting better. Right, I mean, because that's a what a great experience to be opening for two pr yeah. professionals yeah. and doing it for two years straight. I mean, that is just you can't a new guy can't get that type of stage time ever anymore, Jason. Uh, I mean, it, no, for sure. This guy gave me quite uh, an opportunity, uh, and he was just a crazy character. And uh, he had a wad of cash. He didn't take credit card. It was a seventy-five-year-old guy in a suit, and not really a great suit. He had a toupee, a really bad toupee, <laughs> and a wad of cash. And the, this comedy club wasn't in the best area of Saginaw, Michigan. And I always thought, I'm, I wonder if he's got a gun on him or something. <laughs> so how did your act develop over the two-year period? Well, um, I think it really started to give me a voice in comedy. <clears throat> so I would watch a lot of comedians, and I saw, uh, boy, a lot of great comedians come through there like – uh, I know you're, you you do a lot of Christian comedy shows. Like Michael Jr. came through there like every three or four wow. months as a feature. I didn't know that. That's great. Oh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. good to know. That's why I love talking yeah, he to grew comics. Up in it's Grand, awesome. It's so cool. Yeah, he grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So he was doing all the, the Yoder funny business circuit that I was. And, uh, you know, he really exploded. I, I don't know if he, he must have went to L.A. or New York. And then but now he's, you know, big rock star comedian. When, when you were hosting, though, for the two years, did your act change significantly from day one to the end of the second year? Uh, yeah, because I used to tape all my shows on a camcorder and I used to watch them the whole week. Wow. So I would do Friday and Saturday and then I would watch my shows during the week, which I hated watching. Oh, Everybody oh, hates their videos, so bad to watch. especially so when bad. you, when you're terrible, <laughs> try watching it when you get no laugh, try watching for 15 straight minutes, coming home at night, thinking you killed and you're getting nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, why do you think like, you I don't know how many, we are the most, uh, we're the worst at thinking we killed and then watching the video. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, I, I know what I'm not doing well because people aren't laughing. So I, I pretty much know a lot of people don't well, seem to uh, know. You're one of the few that knows that because I get people send me videos to this day. And I, I think to myself, why would you even put this out there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You'd have been better off just emailing me without a video. <laughs> You'd have a better shot at getting hired if I never heard or saw anything you ever did. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so, so, so Jason, seriously, though, you did you 
literally tape every single show? I have every show taped in a box to this day. Wow. Uh, VHS tape. I have hundreds of VHS. Well, maybe there's yeah, there's got to be at least well, a couple hundred in who there. Taught you? No, there can't be a couple hundred. There's got to be a hundred in and there. First of all, nobody does that anymore. And I don't, I don't even know in your in back in the day if anybody really worked that hard at watching themselves. What gave you the idea to watch yourself every single time? My dad, because my dad would come with me to this oh. comedy club at first because it was in a bad area. And I was a little scared. I was a kid. I wasn't, you know, I didn't go, I'd never been to a bar. And uh, I was 19. I wasn't even supposed to be there, I don't think, because we were doing like a, an 8 o'clock and a 10.30 show. You weren't even old enough to be I mean, it, it's crazy. Like, and yeah. everybody thought I was older because I, even though I looked young, I mean, what's this guy doing in this bar? Like, you know, my dad would be like, my dad would, <laughs> kind of was the voice of reason. Like, after the show, like, like a 30 year old waitress would be like, you want to go out drinking? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I think so. And hold on. Let me ask my dad. <laughs> if my dad could come too, we're good to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, so you, your dad's the one. Well, no, my dad put the, what's that? He put the bug in my ear and really was like, if you're going to do this, you got to do it right. And you might as well, like we would drive home after the show and he would be kind of honest with me to the point where I didn't really like it sometimes. Like you go, that wasn't very good tonight. What, 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 what was what was up with that? <laughs> Everything was off. <laughs> you know, you talk too fast. Every time you told a joke, you just went right into the next joke. And so he gave me the the tough love. Uh, I, no, I love your dad. I love the fact that he felt that he was honest with you and that he drove you to the gigs. And it was him who gave you the idea to tape yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, watching those tapes as horrible as it is, and I would double tape them. I would have a micro recorder. <sighs> In my sport coat. I always wore a sport coat because I thought I was Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, my dad always, like, kind of, he didn't make me wear a sport coat, but my dad was like, you know, this guy, is, he wears a suit, and he takes the money at the door, and he's letting you have all this stage time. You should, you know, dress appropriately. Oh, your dad is awesome. So so how did your act change? Because, you know, nowadays comedians would show up in a pair of cargo shorts and a t-shirt with a mustard uh, oh, thing yeah, now forget it Easily. yeah even to go to office people go to the office like that now in underwear sure. they're in underwear and zoom yeah. calls now so it's all gone out the window now yeah <laughs> yeah so so i did actually dress up i went and got like sport coats at the salvation army and they probably had like too long of arms and stuff and <laughs> you know but so so what was your act like at the end of the two-year period though like was it similar just better I want to know, like, oh, was it completely thrown mm. out the window, and it was a completely new act as a host? I no, I, I mean, I think at the end of the two years, there was all the jokes were different because the first jokes I had were so bad I couldn't. Right, so, so you, <laughs> they, you rewrote the whole thing. Couldn't keep them. <laughs> you couldn't keep them. <laughs> yeah, but if you're getting an hour of stage time a week, you get a lot of opportunities to try new yes, jokes yes. and try oh, new yeah. bits and premises. And uh, I mean, the average comedian probably doesn't even get an hour. Uh, of stage time a month now with, right. with open mic. I think that's right. Yeah. And the open mics. In... So I was on comedy steroids, yeah. really. Yeah. So did you feel at the uh, during the process that, hey, I'm I'm getting pretty decent at this? Like, did you start to build how much confidence were you? When you would start to, yeah, maybe after like into the second year where you would, because this club did not pay really good. Uh, I remember it paid headliners four hundred <laughs> for the weekend and two hundred to feature. For the, weekend, for the weekend, four shows. Four shows, wow. Jeez. For the whole weekend. Never getting yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and one of the and they put you at a terrible hotel. One of the comedians got robbed at the hotel once. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, I mean, the guy saved like $10 by putting you in the worst hotel. But uh, no, I mean, by the end, you, you know, when you start doing better than the features, sometimes you feel like really, wow, look at me. Yeah. But then, you know, at the end of the day, I was still – an MC at best. It wasn't a feature. Okay, so were you improving with the crowd a lot also? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's because that's how you learn how to. You had to because I, there was like the same group of people that would come. One of the shows on Friday, he would give out tickets on the radio station, so it seemed like it was always the same people on Fridays. Oh, so you had to improv. Yeah. And funny story <laughs> I was in Daytona Beach last December. My cell phone broke. I went into the Verizon store. I get to talking to this guy, tell him where I'm from, I tell him I'm a comedian. He goes, I remember you. I used to win tickets on the radio, and me and my girlfriend went there every Friday. We were in high school. <laughs> he remembers you. Because from... Jack never ID'd anyone at the door. Well, well, no one got ID'd in those days. I went out to clubs when I was 13 years old. 
So so I did. I was going out to clubs when I was 13 years old. So Jason, I've been asking a lot of comics this. If you're not really connecting on stage now as a more seasoned comic, what do you do to try to, you know, get the crowd going when you feel like you're not really connecting? Well, I think if you improv with the audience or start to talk to them, it can help. Yep. I mean, we've all been in a position where the deck is a little stacked against us, uh, especially and your son will learn this going into these corporate shows where you walk up and they go, well, you're going to, you're going to perform during dinner. Oh, and, uh, oh, you know, oh. we're going to, people are going to run through the buffet line while you start. <laughs> I mean, you have no chance. <laughs> no, no, you don't have any chance. And that's the, well, th- and you try to tell them, but they're like, but listen, we got to do the awards at seven thirty. We just can't. This is why we're doing it. <laughs> well, the reason I bring that up is because I hosted an open mic for comedians for about two years in Long Island. And, you know, I mm-hmm. couldn't do material because no one would listen. So I had to pretty much just talk to the comics. Yeah, that's all I did. So that was va- that was really valuable to me today because I, I could t- go into the audience and talk to people. So I think what you learned in that club was invaluable for you, you know, to be. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I probably there was two guys who were really good at it. Jimmy Pardo was one of them. And uh, he's kind of famous. And Steve Ayat, those two guys could just walk up on stage and just talk to the crowd for an hour and get a standing ovation. I know. And I was like, wow, that's it. I don't know how people do that. I, I know. I've seen comics do that. It's amazing. It, it's a talent. Yeah, it's amazing. So, And the problem is it doesn't always relay. It can't necessarily get you on TV because you created improv with the audience, but it's not really a it's fun. You know, it's, stand-up it's, TV stuff. It's fun, and the audience likes it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I always try to interact with the audience. Okay, so how many years have you been doing comedy now? So we took, we got the two, the first two, the the uh, the yeah, ninety eight. So it was uh, just this March during COVID. I posted it was oh eight eighteen twenty two years. Right. Uh, you're a, you're a full time comic, right? A uh, full time comic slash booker. I mean, uh, I probably put more effort into booking at this point, but I still do like five five gigs a month, five to seven. Well, that's that's more than most people do. So yeah. that's a full time comic. When, when yeah, I say full time, yeah. is you make your total lifestyle or living off the comedy business correct my whole business yeah my whole lifestyle of uh, everything in my end you know everything is comedy that i do for work yeah and like you i try to do the corporates yeah, so tell me a little bit more about now what the type of style comedian you are now hmm. well uh i, I definitely uh why a, a one-liner mix comedian uh, rodney dangerfield's my my hero in stand-up that's comedy. Fantastic. So he's probably my number one inspiration. Okay. And uh, and I loved Mitch Hedberg, who was also a one-liner comedian. So a one-liner comedian. Um, I don't really do any political material. I don't really do the topical stuff because I find it's too uh, hard to write topical stuff all the time. So I, I saw you on YouTube. I thought you're really funny, uh, really good. So do, oh, you, do you know how many jokes you do a minute? Like, do you have it down where you you you, you want to get X amount in every sixty seconds? Are you that defined mm-hmm. with it? No, no, I do have a list of all my jokes that I write down before I go on stage on a piece of paper, and uh, I, I'm still even after twenty two years, I look at the paper and refresh my memory before I go on stage. I don't look at it on stage, but uh, I think writing them down in my brain somehow helps me remember them. Do you know how many there are? No, I've never counted. I have to later. I mean, how how much time are you generally doing now? When you I'll be really out? bummed out when it's like sixteen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> aren't you doing? Are you? Would you generally do forty five minutes to an hour when you perform now? Yeah, at the corporate. Yeah. So that's got to be quite a bit of jokes in there because Dangerfield should tell like five, six jokes a minute. I mean, it's a well. I'm not as good as Danger. I, I I'm inspired by Rodney Dangerfield. I'm not as good as him. I, I definitely have some stories in there too that are maybe a little longer that take up you know five minutes at a time. The booking end of the business. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I have no. I know. I don't even know how you reached me. All of a sudden, I got an email from you one day, and I was on your booking list. I started as a booker in '04. Okay, so this is quite a while now. Only okay. Yeah, so I was only doing like Michigan and Ohio, and I was like mailing flyers to bars trying to get comedy nights going, and it was tough. So I didn't really know any comedians outside of Michigan or Ohio, really. I I mean, I knew some guys, but not enough. Like you being in Florida, I would have never crossed paths with you. I had never done a show in Florida and or New York. Um, So I started to advertise on the internet, like on Google. Also uh, dealt with some. uh, corporate event bookers would would reach out to them and say, "If you need comedians, I can help you." Okay. And that kind of helped 
get the ball rolling. And then suddenly I would, you know, get somebody who needed a comedian in, you know, Reno, Nevada. Well, I didn't know anybody in Reno, Nevada. And I wasn't really sure how far people were willing to go. But when I was at the club in Saginaw all those years, they were bringing comedians in from, you know, New York right. who were coming out to Michigan for, for that. So, so yeah, it just kind of uh, became a, the, the booking business sort of evolved uh, by, tri- by lots of trial and lots of error. So how many comedians are on your booking list now or email list? How many comedians do you reach out to? I mean, how many do you have? Well, my, 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 eight, my 18, I have a, a list of like the premium people. They kind of get the majority of the work, and that's like a couple hundred. That's a lot, like a couple hundred. And then okay. the whole, yeah, the whole email list, if I went and added up all my lists, I would have like I think just shy of a thousand comedians. Ooh, wow, that's a lot. What's the, na- yeah, what's the name of your company? The Comedian Company. The Comedian Company. Now – do you do uh, if I if somebody Google's hey I want a comedian in South Florida will your company come up is that how you get some leads now from yeah from search yeah from search correct engines? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah you I want to be able to pull up like if somebody says hey I want a comedian in Miami or if I want a comedian in Miami I at least kind of want to be in the top five there so I have a shot at at least getting them some options right is that the majority of the leads now coming in from the search engines. That and uh, Facebook advertising, uh, oddly enough, does pretty well because I didn't think people would be searching for a comedian. I thought they would just Google search it, but they just go on Facebook. Well, that's amazing to me. A lot of times. Are you spending a lot of money to get these leads? Yeah. You are, right? Yeah. Like uh, about like $100,000 a year okay. in advertising. See, a lot of people don't realize that. Like yeah. when they – see that I'm, because I'm trying uh, – if I listened to this and I didn't know, I'd be like, "All right, maybe he spends a couple hundred a month." I mean, to be to be a booker, you have to put a lot of money out there. I mean, that's that's well, that's a lot of money to book. And, no, it is. It is. I mean, comics sometimes don't understand. They're like, "Oh, you got to make fifteen percent," and I go, "Well, dude, at fifteen percent, I don't stay in business. I mean, fifteen percent after expenses, maybe." I mean, you have to figure in. It's almost. Eight thousand dollars a month in advertising. Right, that's what I just did in my head when you said that. So, how many shows? Forget about this year. Last year, did you actually book for comics? Do you have an actual number? I don't have the actual number, but it's always it's always at least a hundred a month. Wow! And in the busier season, it can go up as high as like two hundred, two hundred fifty. That's a lot. I mean, I can't believe and you. And when I send you an email, you answer me quickly. I don't know how in the world do you keep up with all that. Well, I work. I work a lot. I'm really dedicated to comedy because I probably because I love it. You know, I, I'm up by eight in the morning and I stop working at like ten or eleven at night. Oh my god! So, all right. So, uh, I mean, I can't imagine there's too many guys who book more shows than you, Jason. I mean, you're booking thousands. As far as volume, no, as far as volume. I, well, in my business, yeah, in my business, like I can't turn customers away. I think some people are like, if a customer comes at you with a low amount of money, these people will turn them away and. I'd rather there's some. I always feel that that gig that doesn't pay great isn't right for you, but it's right for somebody. Okay. Especially somebody who's starting out. Right. And uh, I'd rather have comedians performing than not performing. So how do you handle when you get some feedback that the comedian bombed or just didn't go well? What's how do you handle that? Because that happens. Obviously, it's this is live. <laughs> that well, that's been trial and error too. Yeah, yeah. So like oh four oh five, I would just be like, you know whatever don't call me no more uh oh, really? but my attitude is <laughs> uh, yeah i was like what am i you know i was really would side with the comedians always no matter what and then sometimes now i'll hear the stories like and i go gosh you know the comedian really screwed up here i mean and this very rarely happens uh, this isn't something but especially now that i've kind of figured out who are the really good comedians so like on that a team list those comedians they're not going to screw up but the b team list they might screw up where you you know, if a customer's in a rural area where not a lot of comedians want to go, the show doesn't pay very well. I'll tell the customer right up front. I'll go, listen, you get what you pay for. It's a comedian who's starting out, but he's the only one out of a thousand people who wants to come to your show. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you get a comedian and you'll talk to him and you'll go, listen, it's it's a 60th birthday party. The woman's husband's a minister. Can you just be clean? You don't even have to be funny. Just, <laughs> just be clean. <laughs> And then you, they'll somehow screw that up. <laughs> Not every time. This is rare. I rarely get any complaints. Well, I'm, so that's, I, that's, I'm shocked because I see a lot of comedy that's not great and it doesn't it's just sometimes just the wrong venue like you said maybe just eating dinner you know while the comic's performing so and the fact that you have thousands of bookings just seems well, you know it seems surprising to me. I did have a woman 
wrote a nasty review online for me a couple years ago, and she had a really good comedian. Like, this is a guy that I looked up to when I started out. I mean, just really a powerhouse comedian. And she wrote a review that he wouldn't perform when she said to. And he told me, he goes, listen, I got there. They were, it was the same, I'm, they're running through the buffet. And he goes, I'm going to wait 45 minutes. I'm not going to do this. I've been doing this 30 years. I do cruise ships. I have done television. I'm not going to perform while nobody's listening. Yep. And the woman got really mad about it, but I think he probably killed the audience because of it. Now, what would you have done there? You would have just performed during the buffet? What would you have done? I would have really tried to talk to her about pushing it back. But at the end of the day, as a businessman slash comedian, if that's what she wanted, I would have went up there and ate it on stage <laughs> <laughs> and then drove home like five hours thinking to myself, that was terrible. They could have just... I, I, they should have just given money not to come, half the money not to come, because nobody listened. I mean, do you find that the business takes away from your comedy a little bit? I, when I was, I ran a company in New York for a while, for about five years, comedy to go, and we were booking comics, and I found that that took away from me. Uh, like I couldn't, I couldn't do both. I just didn't have the energy to do. Yeah, both. I don't get to write too much new material anymore. I mean, you know, you'll spitball some material, but I don't sit down and try to write material anymore. So. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you, I, I'm i definitely more focused on being a booker than a comedian at this point, but I still love the, the outlet of performing and making people laugh. Oh. I don't think it ever – I think COVID has probably taught most comedians we really do love our business because hmm. it's been taken away from us. It has, and I, you mentioned to me that you were on a Zoom call. Was that a comedian Zoom call? I did a, I did a 10 a.m. Zoom show this morning for some school administrators in rural Ohio, and uh, great people. They were – you know, they've, they've had a ton of stress. They, most of the kids in this school district, uh, you know, it's poor. They, they don't even have high-speed internet, so they have to drive to the school and get the, <laughs> the, the homework once a week and then bring it back. That's crazy. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Into the, so you did a comedy show for them today? For the school administrators, just 20 minutes of stand-up, and then, um, yeah, just kind of a – they were having a morning meeting, and it was kind of a – Let's add some laughs how, to it. How do you do comedy on Zoom? Like I, like you've been. Po- it's, it's weird. Like, it's yeah, weird. Like you, yeah. like you know, you know, I say no to a lot of things, and just because I. Ha- you do. I do. Why do you have to be like okay, that? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to start calling I, Andrew. I, he does. He's not going to say I, no. I have, he's young. He's I have a lot of respect for you, and this. <laughs> the reason I say no is because I have a full time job, and I do real estate with my wife, and I'll only do a show if I'm going to look forward to it. That's it. I, I do it for fun. You're like my you're like my three good friends in Michigan who are like they'll go, What kind of show is it? Yeah. And I'll go, Oh yeah, it's uh, <laughs> you know, it's baby so, shower. So but I, no, I, I no, I'm not taking Saturday night off for but, that. But like when I so when I hear you do Zoom, like I got like I got I got nervous just thinking about like I got a headache. Like I don't like to think about do how in the world can you do comedy on Zoom? I don't get it. Uh, this one, this was my second Zoom show, and I was actually, this one was not as much fun for me. I could see them. Some of them I could see laughing. Some, they would just sit there, but they all had themselves muted, so I couldn't hear any laughter. Oh, oh gosh. That's like our fuel. Of course. Uh, so how do you, do yeah. so, but why do you say yes? <laughs> I want to know why. Money. I, I couldn't do Money, it. money. <laughs> so are you, you're more money, so you're money motivated. That's a good answer, by the way. I, I'm perfectly, I'm money motivated in my other businesses. I, you know, I tell my wife this. I go, you know what? Comedy is a pretty easy job. I mean, sure, sometimes we have to travel and we have to drive long distances. But for me to turn down this Zoom show for money, and then I drive by guys working 12 hours a day in the blistering sun doing landscaping all day, I wouldn't even feel right. Not. I mean, that's fair. I'm not that lazy. I I need to work. Uh, okay, that's that's fair. So so I, I'm just. I think I, I don't think the Zoom shows are going to make you a better comedian, but I do think it's here to stay. I think you might be right about that. If it is here to stay, that's I'll never do another show the rest of my life. Just so you know. So you personally would basically don't say no to anything if you're available. That's what it sounds like to me. Is that correct? I uh, yeah. The only t- shows I've turned down uh, that I will always turn down are when they want to make fun of the comedian. And this happens very rarely, but like once a year, I'll get somebody call up and they'll go, okay, we want a comedian and he's got to be fat and he has to take his shirt oh, off. And then we're all going to make fun oh, of him right. and like throw marshmallows oh, at really? him. And, and I, I, once a year I get a gig that somebody will say the weirdest stuff to me and I, I, I will stop them. I'll go, listen, I go, I'm a comedian and I'm a comedian booker and I know these comedians and it's a small business. 
and, and I know what they go through. And you want to hire somebody to humiliate them? Like, listen to what you're saying. And then they usually apologize and then call some other company and try to get it. Yeah, that, it reminds me of like like when I told you I don't want to do any house parties. Me and Andrew have gone in and we've done them. And they've been okay. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not looking forward to it. Those are the new house parties are like the number one thing now for me in bookings. I, I was shocked how much fun they can be when done correctly. Oh, yeah, but it's just weird. You, you're dragging speakers into a stranger's house and people, I don't know. Oh, you put more effort in than I do. I just show up and stand in the living room. I don't even have a microphone. Are you kidding me? <laughs> never, never bring microphone to a show. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Me, I, 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 I have oh, not no, brought. We, a, I have not brought speakers. No, we, I, I have Andrew open for me everywhere I go. And that's a great icebreaker. But I bring speakers. Oh you know, yeah. I tell them we want we want the chairs a certain way. Like I want it to be great. I, I, I don't want to do it while they're swimming in the pool. You know, I, it's got to be awesome. Well, you know, no. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I. Oh, hey, here's a funny story. Uh, about three years ago, I did a show in uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which is a very ritzy, you know, the, it's kind of like the Greenwich, Connecticut of Michigan. And this woman was 85 years old and she hired me for her son's birthday party. She didn't tell anybody. So she goes, just show up to my house, his house at six o'clock and walk in. Everybody will be ready. <laughs> this lady paid me in advance, forgot <laughs> about me showing up. Oh. I, sh I, she told me the week of just to walk into the house at six o'clock. I walked into this house. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's two guys that are married to each other and they must've thought a hate crime was going to happen. I walk in now, this is a very ritzy and yeah, I'm underdressed for the, for the neighborhood. But one of the husbands is getting a drink in the kitchen and he walks, <laughs> he peeks over into the living room and he sees me. And I go, hi. And he had like his fight or flight moment. <laughs> he had no idea why I was in his house. <laughs> so he comes up to me and he's like, listen, you're in the wrong house, man. I go, I go, dude, I, I know like maybe somebody punked me, but they like PayPal me $300 last week. I, I, he goes, he goes, he goes, and he was kind of, he was kind of funny and sassy. He was like, we don't have no women who live here. <laughs> and I go, I go, Eileen, Eileen. And he goes, my mother-in-law? And I go, maybe. And she comes out. They go and get her. She comes out and she's like, oh, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Oh, I, thought, I thought they were going to – I'm glad the guy didn't have a gun. Or something. I think he was going to call the cops. I thought he thought I was being – I thought it was – breaking and entering into somebody's home. And then you just did comedy in the living room without a microphone right there. Oh, it gets worse than that. Oh, they weren't God. ready for comedy. They hadn't even eaten yet. I had oh. to hang out with them for an hour and a half and have dinner. I had like a five-course dinner with this ritzy family. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knew me. I was like, I felt so awkward because as a comedian, you want to do your jokes and get out of there. I had burned up all my material through dinner. <laughs> you, you, you peaked at the filet mignon. You were peeking at the filet mignon. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you get nervous before you perform still? And if you do, what, what level of nervousness do you still... I, I'm surprised about the answers I've been mm -hmm. getting to this. Less nervous than I used to because you're so... You got dragged down by this point. If you've been doing it 20 years, you should have your act down. Uh, nervous, I guess, is on a scale of what the audience is. Like... Uh, I do get nervous, though. I mean, there's some level of anxiety. I, I, I think some guys don't have any anxiety, though. But, uh, you know, you see some guys or gals that are just really it's, walk. Get, they show up like five minutes before the show, walk right up on stage and do their thing. And I'm like, I could never do that. I'm there an hour early pacing. <laughs> oh, well, that's a, you're pacing. You, you don't see. I'm so... Yeah, I like to stand out in the lobby of the banquet <laughs> and hall and kind of pace a little bit and think about my act. Uh it, you know, yeah, so on a one to ten, I guess I'm at a four okay. of anxiety uh, for the show. No, no, that that's normal. I mean, yeah. I've I, you know I've been doing it almost what seventeen years, and I'm like I shouldn't be nervous anymore. I have I have hours of material, and I feel comfortable. Yeah, you I, know your material is going to work, but, but I, yeah, each crowd's different, though. Yeah, but I still get that you know that feeling. What am I doing here? I'm like, well, <laughs> why am I here? Yeah, like Andrews would be at a ten. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, I, at his level, sixteen. I wasn't even on stage yet. I. Uh... <laughs> you know, a lot of the comics told me that some of them were 
more nervous now and less nervous when they were newer because they didn't really know. They just had no fear. And yeah. as they kind of know what's happening and, and they assess a room that might not be good, you know, they start thinking about it a little more. Yeah, I, I think the comedians who – and this is kind of rare anymore, but, you know, when there was the comedians who only did comedy clubs and you would take them outside of a comedy club and, and put them in like a house party – or even a moose lodge, and they would just eat yep. it because the the audience wasn't a trained comedy club audience. Yep. But now that's that's almost gone away because unless you're a a really strong powerhouse act or famous, if you want to be a full time comedian, you ain't just doing comedy club. You're doing everything imaginable. So so what? Plus Uber driving <laughs> and waiting on tables when <laughs> maybe right now. Exactly. So, yeah. So comedians send you tapes to kind of get on your list. YouTube videos at this point, you st- YouTube or Vimeo. Are you still looking for comics? Uh, yeah, but they have to really wow me, but I still get wowed. And, uh, I mean, do you, I, uh, do you want, I'll watch the videos. and I mean, do you want to put out your uh, email so people would send you tapes or no? Uh, yeah, they can email a video link to comedianbooker at outlook.com. Comedian. And no guarantees when I'll get to look at it because, you know, it might take me six months to watch some. Um, but when I go through, I do go through every video eventually and it's kind of funny, like, um, 20% of the videos will be people that filmed in their house with no audience, which is, <laughs> like, don't do that. <laughs> I, I have had people stand in front of their shower. There was one guy in Atlanta and, uh, he called himself like Daytona bone or something. Uh, but the guy reminded me of Eddie Murphy and. He had never been on a real stage before, and when I watched him doing his jokes in front of his shower curtain, I actually emailed him, and I'm like, don't send this to anybody. It's weird, but, like, <laughs> these jokes were really funny. You're in Atlanta. Call the comedy club and go to, like, some uh, Atlanta or Georgia comedian Facebook groups and find out where you can perform for real because you obviously have some, some talent here. So is one of the biggest mistakes that comics make is they just don't have a good quality video? Is that true? Oh, yeah. Nowadays, you can't get a booking uh, for corporate events. I mean, I, there's so many good videos out there. If you don't have a good video, you're not going to get booked unless it's a show that's in a, a rural area that nobody wants to drive to for really low money. And how, mu- how much time should it be for a comic for a, a, a little sample video? Four minutes, two minutes? What, what? I, I, I think anywhere from five to eight minutes tops. Okay, and it should be done for... It's like going out for ice cream and you start to sample all the flavors. And these customers are going to sample like eight eight to ten comedians at four to five minutes each. So they're putting maybe an hour of effort into finding a comedian. And what, what's the biggest thing you see comics uh, do wrong in terms of performance? You've, been, you've seen a million comics now. You've been in it for 20 years. Um, if you want to get corporate work and you send me a great six-minute video and for no reason in the middle of the video you say the F word or do a sex joke, You've just eliminated fifty percent of your potential bookings. Oh, that's a good point. So you're saying clean works is what you're saying. Clean gets more work. I think that as a comedian, if you really want to be a comedian, you can. I get these comedians. Oh, I have to have my voice, and my voice is is the f word, and my voice is uh, hour of pot jokes. And I'm like, well, Cheech and Chong did that thirty years ago. You're not coming up with. There's nothing new there, right? And I'm not saying your jokes aren't funny, but there's. If you want to only do bar gigs, sure, you can. You can do that. But if you can work clean to mild PG-13, you can actually make good money at corporate shows and still do the bar shows where you can do completely R-rated if that's your thing. So the guys on your A-list, are they pretty much PG-13 guys? Mo- mostly clean to PG-13. Right. That's interesting. The guys that you get that get the most work and get paid the most money are the most clean, right? Because I don't think people uh, 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 Yeah, the, the, the three, three or four of the top comics that I can think of, uh, one gal and, and three guys, their demos are, are super clean and they purposely work clean and they probably could throw in some sex jokes or the F word to get more laughs, but they know that that's going to dilute their brand. You've been doing yeah. comedy for a long time. If you could go back to like when you first started, is there anything you would have done differently? Hmm. Um, as a 41 year old man, I actually think I w- wish I had, uh, taken some time to step back and enjoy it more Hmm. instead of it being a competition with people that I started with at my level 
and I would look at them and I go, well, I'm only an MC. Why is that guy featuring? He's not as funny. Right. It's a long, long race, and it doesn't matter where the guy ne- or next to you is as far as it's where you're going. And I wish I had maybe not focused on other people because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It's only about if they're headlining after a month, what does it matter to you? You, you can only do what you can do. It is a little annoying, though, to see a new guy do better than you quickly, though, Jason. It is. It's totally it annoying. Is. <laughs> it is. I, I see guys in New York, like, uh, he's starting at this, the comedy class, and then he's, like, headlining in a danger field. Like, what's going on here? Who is this guy? There are some comedians who are just so natural yes. at uh, – and, yeah, it is frustrating because I don't think I'm a natural comedian. I've had to learn it. It's a muscle, but there's – you know, there's always going to be those like basketball players who, uh, you know, there's a there's a Michael Jordan and then there's the 12th man on the bench and, you know, hey, they're all in the NBA. Uh, who's That's the true. who's the best comedian you've ever seen personally live? Ron White. Oh, you've seen him live? Did we see at one of the clubs you were performing? I worked with him at a Funny Bone for a week before, like the blue collar movie had just come out, but he wasn't really famous yet. It hadn't taken off, and I, it was at the it was in South Bend, Indiana, at the Funny Bone, and I remember. Like going, wow, this dude is a, like every bit of his is just hilarious and original. And you know, we're not just comedians, we know where a joke is going. Right, right, right. That dude was just, he was a monster. You, so what was the key, what made him just better than most people you've seen? He was so great at facial expressions. Like he could just move his mouth in a certain way telling a joke and get extra 30 seconds of that's laughter. That's good stuff. That is, that's good stuff. Yeah, Ron White. Ron White killed it, and he's dirty, but like the jokes weren't always. They might have had the effort in them, but if he could take that out, right? But he was killing it. Yeah, you know, I I've, I've read that it takes about ten years to become comfortable on stage, and for me, that's kind of the point where I think I started becoming a little more comfortable in my own skin. Do you think that that's a, a general good? Yeah, uh, I think you're right. I mean, I feel comfortable on stage now, but yeah, for the first. Probably the first decade, yeah, you're still finding your way. You know, you start to just... And you're moving, you know, you're trying to slowly move up the ladder. Well, you're not even slowly moving, trying to move up the ladder. You're trying to move up the ladder as fast as possible. You know, you have one good show and you immediately start calling every booker out there, telling them you're a headliner. So, so your ideal scenario is basically to get this company up and running big time? Not not so much to be a big time comic yourself? It, well, I mean, I, I don't really think I'm going to ever be a big time comedian as much as I would like to be... Uh, I think uh, if I was giving a young comedian like Andrew advice, I would say, I want you to get as much stage time as possible till you're about 22 or 23 and then go to LA or New York and, and, you know, try to get, try to get discovered. And I mean, I know you can still be, you can still kind of get famous outside of those two places, but that's kind of where you still have to go to get famous well, in my opinion. Well, there's a lot more shows there and there's a lot more people. And so there's, you can have a lot more opportunities probably there. Your channel's on YouTube. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. What's it? And that's where the podcast goes up. Yeah, yeah, and and I list it on Facebook too. But thanks for thanks for <laughs> thanks for hanging with us. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much for all it. the work you've given me. Oh man, this was fun. Yeah, this was uh, this was fun to talk about comedy a little bit here tonight. Yeah, I figure guys are home now, and the, I think you'd like the other podcasts I'm doing because every comedian has such a different take on even the same questions I ask. Everyone has such different views on comedy and how it you know affects the rest of their life. So. All right, guys. Yeah, good talking to you both. Take care, Jason. Take care. Thank you. Hey, see you. Okay, bye. Bye.